last Sunday night, uh, we were in our third week of the prophecy study, and I began the topic, who are the elect? And I know for some, this is a new thought, a new idea, because you've heard some different things from many different books. Uh, but what I want to remind us in all of these studies of prophecy is that we need to go to the book. That's what we need to do. And uh, many times folks, folks have asked, they'll say, you know, what, what's the, and I'm, I'm not being facetious when I say it. People say, what's the best book I can get to, to learn about this or learn about that? And I'll tell you, the book you need to start with is this book right here. Start with the book, the Word of God. And uh, dig into this. I mean, find out what it says. Read it and read it again and read it again. And uh, then, you know, maybe if down the road you want to look at some other books, don't go to those books to find out what you believe. In fact, be, be very careful. Um, but maybe you can go to those books to find out a way to say something or maybe a fact or a figure you didn't know, perhaps. But be careful. Be careful. But you can trust this book. You can trust the Word of God. And so my, my challenge always is this, and it's not just in our study of prophecy. It's in anything I preach, is if you can show me differently from the Bible, I'm more than happy to listen. I'm not interested in any movement. I'm not interested in being in a camp. I like what Brother Allen said, Brother Calvin Allen, when he was here. He said, if you run in circles, you get dizzy. I'm not interested in running in circles. I'm really not. I'm interested in what God's Word says. And so my challenge goes forth. Some of these things you may say, I, I've not heard that. It's new to me. A reminder is this. New to you doesn't necessarily mean new. It doesn't. So make sure, make sure you're digging into what the Bible says. Let's be Berean Christians. Acts 17, 11, it says they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, but that, they didn't stop there. It says, and they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. I'm not telling you to take anything at my word. I'm not. I'm telling you to take it at God's word. Go to the Bible, see if these things are so. So there's this false teaching out there about who the elect are, and it matters. And here's why it matters. It matters because there are preachers who say, well, look, the elect, they're, and that's a whole other topic for another day, but they're the Jews, and what they mean is that's modern-day Israel. That's what they mean. And so there are certain portions of the Bible that aren't even for us. I mean, they literally say that. Folks, I'm telling you this whole book is for us. It's all for us. And what I'm telling you tonight, and as I've said last Sunday night, the elect are not, it is not the modern day nation of Israel. And again, I'll, I'll, you say, you're mad at the modern day nation of Israel. No, I want them saved. Uh, I'm not mad at Canada. I want them saved. I want, I want North Korea saved, okay? But the fact is this, the modern day nation of Israel, they are not the people of God. 22%, 22%. Of the modern day nation of Israel is Muslim. You telling me they're the people of God because they live at a certain address? Because they live under a certain flag or a certain name of a country? They're not. I'm telling you. And, and I'm proving this to you from the Bible. I started last week saying we're going to look at every single reference, and we are. Every single reference where the Bible talks about the elect, uh, those who, the election. Uh, in fact, I mentioned last week the elect, it appears 17 times in the Bible, election appears six times. Elects appears three times. Elected appears one time. We made it, I think, halfway through our references. But I want to leave no stone unturned. So there's no doubt in your mind. The next time Dr. Whoever, doesn't matter how many letters he has after his name. Dr. Whoever says, well, the Jews, that's God's elect. That's not what God's word teaches. And I want to make that clear from the Bible, from God's word. And again, just to cut to the chase, who are the elect? Every believer of every physical nation. So if you're from the physical nation of the modern day nation of Israel and you're a believer, you've trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, you are the elect. If you're from the United States of America and you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are the elect. I don't care what nation you're from. If you have believed on Christ, you are, as Paul said in Galatians, you are the Israel of God. I don't want to re-preach all of last week's uh, verses, but you go to Romans uh, many times people say, well, God's just dealing with the church and he's going to pivot back to Israel. Folks, go read that passage carefully. How many trees are there? There's only one. And who's the root? It's Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't matter what physical nation you're from. 
What matters is, are you tapped into the root? Or have you believed on Jesus Christ as your Savior? So I can't go back and revisit all those verses from last week. I hope you'll go read those. And again, I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I'm asking you to go to the Bible, see what God's word says. I do want to revisit three of the passages that we looked at last week and then uh, continue on to the rest of the passages. So let's begin Isaiah 42, the first mention of elect. And again, somebody tell me, what does elect mean? It means chosen, just like you, you elect somebody at the polls, you choose somebody. That's what the word elect means, very simple. Now look at Isaiah 42, the first mention in the Bible of the elect, and who is it referring to? Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah 42, verse 1. It says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. And then we went to Matthew 12 to see that the fulfillment of that prophecy, Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Uh, let's go to another one we looked at. Go to Matthew 24. This is one of those chapters that we're told, oh, don't even read this. This is to the Jews. This isn't to you, folks. This is to us. It's to us. The whole Bible's to us. And I want you to see this again. Matthew 24, verse 29. The Bible says immediately after the tribulation of those days, and it's very important to understand. Again, this is a big misunderstanding. There is a huge difference between tribulation and wrath. Tribulation is affliction, it's persecution. Wrath is fierce, vehement anger. And in context of Revelation, it is usually talking about God pouring out His wrath. It's God on the attack. But notice, after the tribulation, the affliction, the persecution, of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and again if we don't use bible terms we get confused folks read this chapter carefully very carefully what event is this talking about it is talking about 1 Thessalonians 4, the same event, which in 1 Thessalonians 4, we've called it the rapture, and I understand why we call it the rapture, because of the catching away, I understand that. But the point is, it's referring to the same event, which 1 Thessalonians 4, what does it call the rapture? It doesn't call it the rapture, what does it call it? The coming of the Lord. Right here it says, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Does that sound like 1 Thessalonians 4? It's because it's talking about the same event. And they shall gather together his what? Elect. That's not Jews, folks. That's believers of all nations. From the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And again, you, you can't have it both ways. Go down later in that same chapter, verse 44. Therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. He's talking about what we've called the rapture. And that's another topic for another night. I hope you'll stick with us for the whole study of prophecy. Dig into what the Bible actually says. But what I want you to see is that when that sound of the trumpet happens, when Jesus comes, who's going up with him? Who's going to meet the Lord in the air? The elect, every believer of every nation. Go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And again, I want to reiterate that this misunderstanding was the same misunderstanding that was occurring in Jesus' day. There were people, the physical nation of Israel, who thought we are the people of God because we're physical descendants of Abraham. And Jesus said, look, God's able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And he even told them, he said, there are going to be people come from the north, the south, the east, west, going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom, and the children of the kingdom, the physical descendants, are going to be cast out. Why is that? Because, again, it's not about having a certain DNA or a certain address, folks. It's about having Jesus Christ as your Savior. So notice Romans chapter 11. These verses, again, are commonly used to teach the exact opposite of what they're teaching. Now notice what Romans 11 says. Verse 1, Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Many go, see right there, pastor, he hasn't cast away Israel. No, hold on. He's telling you how he has fulfilled his promise to Israel. How has he fulfilled his promise? 
I'll tell you how he's fulfilled his promise. That through Jesus Christ, every person who believes on him is part of the Israel of God. That's how God has fulfilled his promise. And we saw that later on in uh, Romans eleven twenty six 26, when it says, So, or in such a way, all Israel shall be saved. But notice verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, Paul says. For I also am an Israelite, and he's speaking physically right now, of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. What, why did he even say that? His point is, look, I am part of the Israel of God. The fact that God has saved me is proof he has kept his promise. Now notice verse 2. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, that's Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone. And he wasn't, but he thought he was. And they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? Notice, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Why is Paul bringing this up? Because his point is this, even back in Elijah's day, there was a min minority, there was a remnant, a small piece of the people who truly were people of God. There were all sorts of physical descendants, but there was a small group of people who really were people of God. So notice he continues in that thought in verse 5, he says, even so. Then at this present time also, there is a, what's the word? A remnant. Remember again, ladies who sew, you use little bits of cloth. It's a remnant. It's not the whole bolt of cloth. It's a little piece. It's a small piece. He said, even right now, the same way, there's a remnant according to the, what is it? Election of grace. What does that mean? God has chosen the whole world. He wants the whole world to be saved. Salvation is by grace through faith. He did not choose some to be saved and some to be lost. He has called the whole world. He has chosen the whole world. Jesus Christ is the Savior for the world. Now notice verse 6. It says, And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. And as I said last week, I want you to say that five times fast. Ready? Go. No. Verse 6. What, what is he saying? Your salvation is either by grace, meaning you don't deserve it, and it's from God's kindness and favor, or you have to work and earn it. It can't be both. By definition, it can't be both. And his point is, listen, that God has made it by grace so that everybody could be saved. You see, God's made it by grace. He put, he put the bar so low. We could not attain to the righteousness we need to impress a holy God. So he said that we get righteousness, how? By faith. It's imputed to us. It is counted to us for righteousness. Jesus Christ's righteousness is put on our account. Now notice verse 7, and I don't know if there can be a more clear verse here, that there is a difference between the physical nation of Israel and between the elect. Notice verse 7. What then? Israel, speaking of the physical nation, hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. Did you notice that? He just said the Israel, the physical nation, and those who are the elect are different people. And they are different people. Now, are there some of the physical nation of Israel who are the elect? Absolutely. Anybody who's believed on Jesus Christ. But notice, the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, all those verses we did look at last week. I want to move into new verses this week. Again, we're going to cover every verse in the Bible that refers to the elect, election, the elects, elected. And so we leave no stone unturned so that at the end of this, you have no doubt in your mind, no doubt in your mind that you just plainly read what the Bible says. And if you're a believer, you are the elect. Let's pray. Lord, please speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to cast away preconceived notions and ideas. Help us not to trust man's word over yours, Lord. May you be true and every man a liar. Lord, may we trust your word above all else. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to uh, these passages. Go to Luke 18, please. Luke 18, verse number 1, Jesus is telling a parable. And by the way, a great truth in verse 1. If you ever think, feel like quitting or giving up on something you should not quit or you should not giving up, give up on, what should you do? You should keep going back to God, praying and bringing your burden to him over and over and over and over again. That's the story here in Luke 18. Well, notice Luke 18, 1. It says, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So I've kept bringing that burden to the Lord. Good, you keep bringing it to the Lord. Cast your care upon him. For he careth for you. And then you go out and find somebody else's burden to lift. Now, I'm not going to read the whole story, but go to verse, verse 6. It says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own 
elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Folks, is that promise just to a physical nation called Israel? No, I'm telling you, that promise is to me. I, I'm a, a citizen of the United States of America, and verse 7 is for me. That God will avenge me, his elect. I'm one of his children. I'm one of his people. I am the Israel of God. And notice verse 8, he says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Uh, I think it's pretty clear in that verse. The elect are believers of all nations. Uh, go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. You know, the city of Colossae, was it a, was it a, a, a Jewish stronghold? Was it a, a, nation, a, a city full of physical Jews? No. Uh, but look at what he says to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. And remember that Paul is the uh, apostle to the what? Somebody tell me. To the Gentiles. That doesn't mean he never told Jews how to be saved, but he is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's in, he said, I magnify mine office. Now look at Colossians 3.1. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Now in context, is this to us, believers? Or is this just to physical Jews? No, this is to us. This, we, we should set our affection on on things above, not on things of the earth. Now, go down in the same, we can read the whole passage if we wanted to, but go down to verse uh, 9. He says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds, as we've seen Wednesday nights, that old nature, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We ought to be putting on Jesus Christ. Remember, we have those two natures that battle every day. Which one do we feed? That's the one that's strongest. So keep feeding the, the spiritual man. Now notice verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. We saw Romans 10 last week that there is no difference. Right here he says there is neither Greek nor Jew. Circumcision nor uncircumcision. So obviously we're speaking of the flesh here. Uh, notice barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. But Christ is all in all. Put on therefore as the, what are the next three words? Elect of God. Is this to us or the physical nation of, the, of Israel? This is to us, every believer. doesn't matter what nation you're from. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. Well, that one person I'm mad at, I don't have to forgive him because that's to the physical, the physical nation of Israel. No, no, this is to me. This is to you. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. How about that physical Jewish stronghold of Thessalonica? Oh, no. No, it's not. Uh, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 4. Again, Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica. And notice what he says about them. Uh, in verse, uh, verse 2, he says, We give thanks to God always for you, all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your, what's the next word, your what? Election of God. And, and how did they become the elect of God? Verse 5, for our gospel, there it is. By believing the gospel, by trusting Jesus Christ. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Are these folks in Thessalonica the elect of God? They absolutely are the elect of God. And yes, they are Gentiles. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Here's one I'm not going to dive into too deeply. The Bible talks about elect angels and there is a there is. A, uh, a disagreement between some, and I wouldn't waste too much time delving into it. My own personal belief, when you read this in context, is he's talking about spiritual leadership in a church. I believe he's talking about uh, preachers and elders. And the reason I believe that, again, from the context of 1 Timothy 5, and when you go to Revelation 2 and 3, and Jesus is writing to the angel of the church, who is the angel? It's the preacher. He said, you have, you're an angel, Pastor? Yeah, I've got a halo and wings. No, the word angel means messenger. And so he uses the word angel, Revelation 2, Revelation 3, speaking to the preacher. So I personally believe 
that this angel here he's speaking of, that they are the, the preachers, the elders, because the whole chapter starts about how to deal with elders. And uh, if you go to verse, um, verse 17, how to, how to treat the elders. And verse 18, uh, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Verse 19, against an elder, receive not an accusation. So this whole, this whole uh, group, this whole scripture is all about the leadership in the church. So verse 21, though, he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. And he continues the thought about spiritual leadership in a church. Verse 22, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Laying hands suddenly on no man means don't put anybody in a place of spiritual leadership quickly. Let them prove their faithfulness. Let them prove their dedication to the Lord. Uh, so again, we have the elect angels. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. But I don't think from 1 Timothy 5.21 you can pull anything that says that's the physical nation of Israel. All right? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Again, Paul was the apostle to whom? He said it, to the Gentiles. Doesn't mean he didn't preach to Jews, do he? He did. Uh, but he said, I have a unique calling to go to the Gentiles. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Knowing that he is the apostle to the Gentiles, what does he say? He says, in fact, go back to verse 9. He says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. What is he saying? Those who are going to believe on Christ. I suffer these things so that they can be reached. The elect's sake. It doesn't matter what nation they're from. Go to Titus chapter 1. Notice Titus chapter 1. Notice verses 1 and 2. Say, Pastor, we don't need all of these to prove this. We do. And the reason we do is too many Dr. So-and-sos in their books have said other things. We need to know what God's word says. We need to have no doubt in our mind when we leave here that we, God's people, believers of all nations, we are the elect. Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Uh, so again, um, it's talking about the gospel, the Savior, verse 3. Uh, now go to 1 Peter. There's a whole lot of these in 1 Peter. And just some really powerful, uh, very clear verses here. 1 Peter. Notice 1 Peter 1, 1 through 3. 1 Peter 1, verse 1 through 3. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those are Roman provinces. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Through sanctification of the Spirit. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins are washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the gospel. We are saved by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, by accepting God's payment for our sins. That's how his righteousness is imputed unto us. Uh, go down to chapter 2. Now notice chapter 2, verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 5. And, and again, there's many. I wish we could fill in all the gaps here. But notice what he says. Verse, uh, in fact, go back to verse 4. It says, To whom coming as unto a living stone. He's referring to Jesus Christ, the cornerstone disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, so just like Jesus is the elect, he's the first time uh, that the elect is mentioned, so we also who are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ, we also are the elect, verse 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Who is that? Somebody tell me. That's Jesus. 
elect, precious. And he that believeth on him, doesn't matter what nation you're from, shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient. And by the way, that doesn't matter what nation you're from. If you're of the physical nation of Israel and you don't believe on Christ, you are headed for hell. And you need a Savior. And He is your Savior. You need to call on Him. Notice, uh, notice, unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Don't miss verse 10. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Amen. Folks, who are the people of God? Saved believers of every nation. We are the people of God. We are the elect. We are the saints. All those terms you, you want to see in the scriptures, that's who we are. How are we that? Through Jesus Christ. In time past, we're not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Uh, go to uh, chapter 5. This one gets even more interesting. Um, are the elect, the, is it the physical nation of Iraq? <laughs> well, look at chapter 5, verse 13. Notice. The church that is at, where is it? Babylon. Somebody tell me what modern day nation, where, where is Babylon? It's Iraq, right? It's in Iraq. The church that is at Babylon, elected. Wait a minute, maybe we've had this wrong the whole time. Maybe the elect are actually the modern day nation of Iraq. No, folks. Now, are there elect from Iraq? Absolutely. People who've believed on Jesus Christ, but of all physical nations. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you. Saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're almost done turning over stones. All right, here we go. 2 Peter 1 verse 8. He's talking before this about how we have exceeding great precious promises in the word of God. How that we ought to add to our faith and build uh, with our faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, all these things. And then he says, verse 8, for if these things be in you... And abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather brethren, and by the way, he's speaking to believers. Just again, read this chapter. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this is not the topic tonight. But folks, this is not saying you can lose your salvation. There's a big difference, verse 11, between entering the, kingdom of, the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and entering it abundantly. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that some people will be saved, yet so as by fire. They'll make it, why? Through the grace of God, but have nothing to put at the feet of Jesus Christ. No rewards. A life lived selfishly just for self, whereas some will have rewards because they've lived a life unto the Lord. So there's a big difference. I heard a pastor mention this verse. He said one time somebody gave them tickets to go to such and such an amusement park. He said they went there, they had no money with them, but just had tickets. They went all day, didn't eat anything, had massive headaches when they left, sunburn. He said, we went, we had our ticket. He said, then another time somebody sent us there and they gave us an envelope of money. This pastor had a really big family. He said, they gave us an envelope of money. And he said that one of his sons who always, always asked for, to buy things, always, whether he needed or not. Dad, can I buy this? No. Dad, can I buy this? No. Dad, can I buy this? No. Big family. He said that particular day his son ran up to him and said, Dad, can I buy this? And he went, sure. And he went, what? What? Dad said yes, and he went running telling everybody, like, I can't believe it. He said the point is this, one time we entered, the other time we entered abundantly. You know, are, are you going to have any rewards to offer to Jesus Christ? Are you going to be saved yet so as by fire? Just, and it is by the grace of God. But are, are you going to, going to give your life to the Lord to be used in his service that you might have some rewards to present to him? Uh, look at verse, uh, uh, go, go to 2 John. 
2 John. And by the way, this Wednesday, uh, we will be in 2 John. We finish, or no, I'm sorry, we won't. We have to finish 1 John 5. It'll be a couple of Wednesdays from now. Uh, 2 John, notice verse 1. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. And then verse 13, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Believers have the truth dwelling in them. Now, if you've been here tonight and last week, I've looked at every verse in the Bible. Every verse that mentions elect, election, elected, the elects. And can you point me to scripture that says the modern day nation of Israel, that they are the elect of God? Folks, what I'm telling you is God's word is abundantly clear. That the elect are believers of every physical nation. That you are the people of God. That you are the children of God. That you are the saints of God. That you are the elect of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Praise God. And you know what that means also? That means this whole book is for me. It's all for me. When a pastor says, oh, you ignore that passage. That's not for you. You just, you just go, yeah, he needs to study more. <laughs> so he needs to read his Bible. Now, I'm not telling you this so you can go out and flaunt your knowledge. I'm telling you this so you understand your standing in Jesus Christ. And so that you can go forth with the truth to people who need the gospel. I want to look at one more passage. The Bible doesn't use the term elect. But it's the same principle. Go to Ephesians 1 if you would. How about that great Jewish stronghold of Ephesus? No? Look at Ephesians chapter 1. And boy, this chapter is just rich. I mean, it's all, it's all rich. But it talks about our spiritual blessings in Christ. Things we don't deserve, but we have because of Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Notice verse 3. It says, blessed. In fact, go back to verse 1. It calls them saints. That they're, that that has been peddled out there before. Well, the saints, that's, that's you know, that physical, that's the Jews. No, it's not. It's the Israel of God. It's believers of all nations. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Amen? He has, yes. Notice, according as he hath chosen us, notice that word, chosen us, in him before the foundation of the world. You know, before God created the world, he knew he would have to give his only begotten son. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the Bible says. He knew. Some people say, why would God even allow that? What would you think of God if he said, you have to love me? I'm going to make you like a robot. You're going to choose to love me. You know what? Would you love that if you're, you got a card from your spouse or from your kids? And they said, you know, happy Father's Day, happy birthday. I have to love you. <laughs> you wouldn't like that. Neither would I. But isn't it nice when somebody chooses to love you? You know what? We have a choice. God chose us. He said, I love you so much. I'm going to go to the cross for you. I'm offering you free salvation. I want you to be my people for eternity. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to to the riches of his grace. Folks, we are the elect. Believers are the elect. All nations. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you're the elect. You're the saints of God. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, thank you that our election wasn't dependent upon our works, but upon your grace. That you made salvation available freely to all. You paid the price for all of every physical nation. And that what we must do is accept your payment for our sins. Believe on you as our Savior. Thank you, Lord. You made it so simple. That Thank you that we are your people. Uh, thank you that you, you've prepared a place for us eternally so we can see you face to face for eternity. Uh, Lord, sometimes there's troubles and heartaches and heartbreaks in this world. 
valleys and storms, but, but there's something beyond this world you've prepared for us. Thank you so much. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you know you're the elect, you're the people of God, you're saved, would you just lift your hand and thank the Lord again for saving you? Don't ever get over that. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. What's the purpose of prophecy? We studied the first week, Revelation 19.10. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The whole point of knowing these things is not just to have a head full of knowledge, but it's to go out with an urgency to get the gospel to every creature. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Who would say, dear Lord, use me this week. I give you myself, use me to get the gospel to someone this week. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Thank you, Lord, again for your word. Bless it to our hearts. May we remember the things we've heard. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. I do want to ask one more question. Is there anyone who'd say, Pastor, I'm not saved. I'm not sure that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. Is there anyone like that? Would you lift your hand tonight? All right. Uh, Brother Matt's going to come lead us in a song. Right after the song, we're going to have uh, just a brief business meeting. Again, Lord, thank you for this service. Thank you for your people here tonight, the elect, the saints. Thank you for the fellowship we enjoy around your word. Thank you for making it possible. Bless in the rest of this service and in the business meeting to come. In Jesus' name, amen.